Baba. Live video is starting. Hello. Whoops. There we go. Let's see what we got. Good evening, all. Go ahead and fast forward five minutes because we're going to start in five minutes. And as usual, I'm going to work on trying to figure out where the chat box is because I never seem to be able to find it. Preview link, no, recent polls, options. Aha! There it is. There I am. <laughs> hey, if you're just tuning in, I'm Bob Lindy from the Tradition School of Verbal Studies, and we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. So let us know who you are, where you're from, and please post any questions you might have. started here in just about four minutes and I've got a couple of interesting questions lined up but plenty of room for other questions yes I have my pen and um, we'll get started right at six o'clock and sadly shut down right at eight o'clock well good for me so I actually take a little break so let us know who you are when you jump on here where you're from and if you got any interesting questions feel free to Toss them out there and uh, put them in the chat box. It's, I have no idea where it is on your computer. Um, but we've got some interesting stuff, all kinds of interesting new classes coming up, and questions about digestion, mint, acid, reflux, directionality of herbs, the uses of artemisias, emotions, and organ associations in Chinese medicine, adaptogens, and a little bit about West Coast chapter of the American Herbalist Guild. Well, lots of people on here. Wow, you guys are jumping on here. Awesome sauce. Well, hang tight. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Um, overdose of everyday mushrooms. Uh, you mean kind of like, um, and hey, pickles. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Uh, this overdose of eight mushrooms in a blender. Huh. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Are you just talking like adaptogen mushrooms being used to excess? <laughs> hey, Kristen. Hey, Gray. <laughs> no, everyone knows. Awesome sauce. Uh, oh, eight mushrooms. I'm not sure I know what you mean there, Pickles. And for anybody just jumping on, we're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Please. Uh, post any questions you've got, and I'm going to try to figure out what Pickles is referring to here. Or dose of eight mushrooms in a blender. Huh. I don't think I've heard about this. Oh, crap. Broken shoulder, that sucks. Oh, okay, yes. I understand what you mean. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> yeah, that kind of actually was going to be part of the conversation of about adaptogen. So perfect sauce. Um, and I'm sorry to hear about the shoulder. That's a crappy thing to break. I had no idea. Blends adaptogens. All right. Damn, that helps if I can spell adaptogen, huh? Oh, gens. All right, cool. For anybody who's just joining us, please post your questions. We're going to get started in just one minute. Wow. That was five minutes went fast. So... Ba, ba, ba. I'm waiting for the magic clock to tick down. Yay. And nice to see people jumping on really fast. Hopefully we'll get tons more folks coming on here. And I officially see eh, close enough to 6 o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and start saying things because I got too much stuff to say. If you don't know it, I'm Bob Lindy from the Tradition School of Herbal Studies. I am an acupuncture physician and a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild. And uh, I not only have the 
cool herbal program here all the way from beginner to clinician with clinical practice for at least a year in both our Western and Chinese herbal programs, as well as lots of other cool classes that are always ongoing. You can find out more at traditionsherbschool.com, as well as find out about our intern clinic where our senior students get practice in both Western and Chinese, as well as some acupuncture physicians that I supervise from our local acupuncture school. You can find out more at AccuHerbals, 1C, A-C-U-H-E-R-B-A-L-S.com. Um, and I'm sitting here in the lovely school that is at 6340 Central Avenue, and our clinical practice is at 2520 Central Avenue. So all of our classes are here, um, where we have a half-acre medicinal garden with all kinds of cool stuff happening. And if you don't know it, and I know, I think I know everybody who's online right now, y'all heard this spiel before, so I apologize. But if you don't know it, during COVID, we started doing this, um, as a way to stay connected to our community, as so many of our classes had to be rescheduled um, and a lot of people were going out, I felt really disconnected from our herbal community. So it's probably been two years now uh, that I've just been like, hey, throw it out there, um, two hours, pick my brain, and uh, really have enjoyed it so much. And so even though we're back to normal-ish, you know, we're in Florida, COVID doesn't exist, uh, back to normal here with all of our classes, both online and in person. So even if you're not comfortable coming out or not feeling well a particular day, you can jump right online for all of our classes. Um, but I had so much fun doing these and I've had so many positive comments that people uh, were happy, especially of the people who really isolated throughout the world, literally, um, that I decided to just keep going regardless. So uh, every month, the last Friday of every month, I uh, set up this on Facebook. And you can send in questions ahead of time or just as uh, the mood strikes you, you can feel free to throw things in your chat. And I will do my very best because I'm, I'm here solo and um, I could easily miss a question. Um, oh, yeah, hopefully y'all. I can't see everybody who's on there. So, hey, Jeremiah and Tabitha. Super excited. Tabitha, who's like taking everything we ever teach and is now on her way to acupuncture school. Super jazzed about that. Um, so let me just go over some of the cool stuff that we've got coming up um, this coming Sunday. Yes, there it is. January 1st. I Every year I do a uh, kind of a New Year's present to the community and I do a free herb walk for about two hours. But it is a reward for those people who don't overindulge the... Um, oop, let me write that down, Mira. Hey, long time no see. Um, herb drug interactions all right you are at the list um i do a, a free herb walk every year a just as a gift to the community that's supported me for the, over 20 years now and also i always try to do it in uh, an area that's a little bit more underserved so it's always over on the south side somewhere that there's not enough activities going on there and that community is oftentimes neglected um, so at 9 a.m for those of you who are able to get up um, at forest bluff park which is down just off of 4th Street and 65th. And uh, there's a little half uh, dirt half circle that will park there. If I'm really motivated, I'm going to make some Wayusa because I, it'll be chilly at that hour. Uh, dress for the weather. There's a chance of sprinkles, but outside of the torrential downpours and thunder and lightning, I'm still walking out there. So um, I hope you can join us and, and learn all kinds of cool stuff that's out there in the park. Um, then literally uh, the... Next Friday, January 6th, we've got, I'm so excited, we've got a, um, a local artisans, uh, lots of cool vendors, and we're going to have the market here at the school. I'm hoping this becomes an uh, ongoing event. Uh, so it's the full moon market uh, that's been going on in our community for, I don't know, a couple of years now. Uh, so Tracy has been kind enough to move the market over here. So starting at 7 to 11, there'll be a drum circle somewhere. I'm going to I may be doing the first nighttime herb walk ever. Uh, so I'll have lanterns or a flashlight or something, but I'm doing an herb walk. Uh, so do come out. I'll probably do it about 7, 730. We'll see how the crowd is doing. So get here early. Um, and you'll have a chance to visit all the vendors. And if you are interested in vending, that you've got products that you create here in the community, um, please reach out uh, to Tracy. You can go on Facebook and look for Full Moon Market on January 6th. 
Um, that weekend, Saturday and Sunday, uh, Ruthie, I don't know if she's on here or not, are going to be teaching our Western Herbal 101 series that is the start for the Western program for any of you who are interested. Um, and remember, if you've taken it before, uh, you're welcome to sit through it again. We usually have space for a couple people to sit in in person uh, or who can join us online if you've done it before. And that class is also online for anybody who's out of the area or doesn't feel like it. Then January 7th, I'm super excited. I have harassed one of our graduates. I'm about to say student, but no, she's a graduate. Um, Shannon is helping us to, uh, she's working with the past president, um, uh, Vanessa, uh, to reconstitute, if you will, the uh, local West Coast of Florida AHG chapter, the American Herbalist Girl uh, chapter. Um, so we're going to have our first meeting that Saturday night at 5.30, and I'll be posting the crap out of that event uh, as soon as we get done with this, probably this evening. Um, oh, where are I? And then Ruthie's got her regular medicine-making uh, collective that she does. That's going to be on Blue Lotus, and I'm going to have to come to that one because I don't know enough about Blue Lotus. I've only nibbled on a leaf or two and tried to understand it, and that's not enough information. So I know I'm gonna be there to learn about Blue Lotus. Uh, it's one I read a lot about, um, but I don't have enough personal experience uh, to really talk with any honesty about it. Uh, so that is January 12th, again, online or in person. Uh, our regular ongoing series of Anatomy for the Herbalist is coming up on January 19th. This uh, month it will be on the reproductive cycle. That's always an interesting one. Occasionally I um, show up to that one to make bad jokes. Um, and then Gray, yay Gray, uh, will be doing, a, I think this is a new one. It's part of her ongoing Ayurvedic series on January 26th. And it's going to be managing uh, stress and the effective use of Tulsi and ashwagandha. And I kind of, Gray, and if you're able to stay on, one of the questions I've got in here was about ashwagandha and its use as an adaptogen. And I would love your input on that. Um, and then Ruthie's got a new series coming up. She thought that really the, the early 20s and teens were being neglected in the herbal realm. And those are up and coming herbalists. And we need to engage them and get them excited. So if any of you are, um, you know, I'm going to say under the age of 25 uh, and over the age of 10, uh, please reach out and find out more about that. But it's going to be the Young Person's Herbal Empowerment Circle uh, that's meant for teens to early 20s. Uh, and it's going to be a theme that will incorporate herbs and more uh, activities. Um, but teens to, or oh, sorry, I said that. Um, this one's going to be about the new year and new beginnings and uh, is going to be um, kind of like setting uh, some intention and using herbs and ceremony, I believe. And I'm getting it. That's just for the month of January. Oh, my God. Uh, and I'm just going to put a bug in everybody's ear because I'm super excited about it. I'm going to be teaching a weekend intensive on wilderness survival with a focus on Florida. Um, oh, nice. Uh, well, hopefully we won't tra traumatize them too much. Hey! <laughs> Hold on, everybody online. Come on in. Hi, Bob. Is there a place I can park my bike? Um, you can bring it inside if you want. <laughs> hey! All right, so I'm going to move myself a little bit so i'm super excited about that tabitha um hopefully she will enjoy herself and feel free to come and come in with her if you want we're gonna have i actually have somebody coming live in person so i'm super excited so i'm gonna put us back online because nobody ever comes to play ah i'm gonna plug us in here so you may get a weird thing happen on the screen but that's okay and if I'm lucky, that will pop up on the wall here in a second. Hey. Yeah, hey, you're I'm it. Oh, yeah, well, that happens all the time. Most people come online, and I'm always excited when people show up in person. Hey. So kind of person. <laughs> that's okay. So, yay, I have a live person again. Whoops. <laughs> I'm going to say about every three or four a live person shows up. So you're it. All right. I got myself back tuned in. Um, yeah, I'm super excited about Ruthie's uh, series coming up, and I'm hoping she gets a wonderful turnout so that we can start to engage our younger folks. All right, um, oh, I'm going to start with an easy one. Uh, and Mira, it's like uh, good to see you on here. Um, sources for herb drug interactions. So one of the um, hardest things, I think, is to find a decent resource for that. 
uh, Francis Brinker, and I'm going to pretend to spell his name correctly. Uh, Francis uh, Brinker, and he's an ND. Uh, is uh, he's got a book on hopefully? Oh yeah, you can see the chat. Cool. <laughs> yeah, here, you're following along the same as me. Um, so Francis Brinker's book focuses on mostly Western herbs. I don't think there is a decent source on Chinese herbs, unfortunately. Um, although a lot of herbs are crossover, so making sure that you're familiar with your um, Latin names, you can find the same genus and sometimes the same species, Western or Chinese. Um, and he actually goes through and not only gives you an idea of what's an issue, he'll tell you how the research is being done. So he's going to talk about, is it made up? Is it conjecture? Is it clinically, clinical experience with it? Is it in vivo, in vitro? Um, and it is probably the most up-to-date uh, because every couple of years he puts out a new edition. Um, and one of the easiest ones to make your own decisions because so much of it is BS. Um, and I will say uh, I encourage you to check out the um, herb drug interaction lectures I have on the YouTube page. Oh, see, I forgot to say that too. So I said AccuHerbals and in Tradition School uh, Tradition's Herb School, but also the Herb School has a YouTube page with lots of uh, past classes. So the Herb Drug Interaction class really talks about a practical way to approach that um, and how we can use our herbs safely. But, you know, if we're looking at something like working with cancer and so forth with so many of our herbs, that's a whole different thing. And I feel like it addresses that issue of not every herb can be listed, how do we incorporate the idea of formulation, um, and it's easier than it would appear. <laughs> Even though it's one of the scariest things, it, it is one of the most important things for me because I work primarily with herbs. I will say that I've had adverse reactions to herbs, and that's because I did something wrong, i.e. gave somebody a rash, made somebody have diarrhea, constipation, things like that. Um, I've literally, following my own guidelines that I put out in that herb drug interaction class, I've never actually had an herb drug interaction. Um, so it's not that hard. Uh, uh, mental health and psych meds, that gets even more challenging. I would actually encourage you um, to look at those herbs specifically, and I, I'm going to name a few. It's not so much that it's an herb drug interaction, so much as certain herbs are contraindicated with certain uh, mental health conditions like bipolar disorder. Um, mimosa, Hihuan P is specifically contraindicated. I believe um, valerian is specifically contraindicated. Don't quote me on that. I'm positive about the um, uh, mimosa. Um, so we see a little bit of research starting to show up and the problem is too many times I've heard uh, from very well-respected herbalists that, well, I've done that with bipolar and I didn't see a problem. And the, it, it gets down to being safe because, A, mental health disorders are oftentimes very difficult to um, diagnose and they're oftentimes layered on each other. They're throwing just, hey, you got that symptom, therefore you got this. And, you know, um, and so most of the herb drug or, or the drug diagnosis interactions I've seen are with bipolar 2 disorder, and so there's subcategories of each one of those mental health issues. Um, and I think it's safer and easier to just say, and, and I want to say there's five or six herbs that are specifically contraindicated uh, with certain mental health issues, and it doesn't always make sense. It just seems to cause a problem. Um, so being extra cautious and watching for flare-ups with mental health issues. Ah, rhodiola, thank you. I knew there was like a couple other common ones. And I was like, gah. And, and it's crazy because if we were thinking about like uh, the triggers for some uh, flare-ups of bipolar disorder and other mental health issues, um, it would seem logical to give mimosa flower to somebody dealing with that. It would seem logical to do rhodiola with some folks. And so there's a few of those that are experiential that I think are really important um, if you're working with that community, especially um, to get a list of like, just don't do it. Uh, and that's a trick. That's a trick. And, and I hate to say it, we continue to learn new ones um, because there's no research being done on that.
uh, and that idea of us sharing as a profession. Um, oh, yes, and St. John's Ward, thank you. <laughs> and the St. John's Ward, I would say, isn't near necessarily specifically contraindicated with some mental health disorders. Um, it, it's contraindicated with prescription medications, all of them. Um, and I would say that in a depressive state, St. John's Wort might be indi uh, indicated, um, but not, you know, because when we think of um, St. John's Wort, it's for nerve issues or kind of that melancholia, Eeyore kind of uh, uh, behavior. And so that could be a depressive disorder uh, of some sort. Just never, ever, ever use St. John's Wort with any prescription medications or over-the-counter medications. You know, birth control is contraindicated and so forth. I'll say that one until, you know, the cows come home. And, you know, one of, one of our herbalists uh, and acupuncturists literally has the tattoo of St. John's Wort for her twins. Uh, <laughs> oops. Um, and I would say, um, so when we look at herb drug interactions, there's different, there's sometimes like literally, if you go to the physician's desk reference, that's kind of the, the big fat Bible of how do you use drugs uh, for, it's for physicians. Um, one of the things that they um, look at, and, and sorry, it's kind of the, I'm giving you the short version of a very long pharmacology class I teach. Uh, we look at how drugs are absorbed in the body and then processed and excreted out of the body. And so usually that's the liver is the two-step breakdown of um, drugs, food, everything. Um, and then our body either excretes that through the kidneys, uh, most commonly, uh, or it's going to absorb it and utilize it to do stuff in the body. And they, we look at this, P450 is a silly thing, but that's, they look at particular pathways that uh, things are absorbed, uh, are processed through the liver. And so 45% of all prescription medications are put through one of three pathways and St. John's wort also does. So they're competing for the same space uh, or pathway through the liver. And what happens is um, it can either slow down the absorption or, or the, uh, uh, the absorption and excretion of a medication or speed it up. And so we're getting more bang for our buck. And so for some things that doesn't matter um, for other things like chemotherapy, uh, certain types of HIV antiviral kind of stuff, that makes a difference. Or if it's slowing the absorption of th something like birth control, maybe that makes it ineffective. Um, so it's really about, it's just competing for the same processing space and then either speeding up or slowing down its absorption and excretion through the body. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, there's a way longer, more complicated pharmacology than I'm in, able to even go too much deeper than that because I'm not a pharmacologist. Uh, hopefully that answered all of those. Those are good questions. I like those. So, and anybody who's just law, jumping on here, feel free to say, hey, where are you from? And let us know if you got any questions. Ooh, sorry, I'm gonna, Sally, I'm going to read this one real fast. Ooh, that's a long one. Let me read that. Um, about my cat who is taking gabapentin for nerve injury that's exasperated when she's agitated or stressed. Okay, ashwagandha was recommended. It's one of the herbs um, to help with agitation from the nerve injury or other stressors, but the ashwagandha seemed to a little bit too much for her. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, okay. Awesome. Well, make sure you come to classes come February. Um, so, Gabapentin is always an interesting one, um, and it is, it's actually an anti-seizure medication that also happens to help with nerve pain or neuropathy pain. Um, and you build up a tolerance for it uh, to the point where, at least on humans, it, it tends to not do a very good job after a while. Um, <laughs> awesome. Uh, 
And so one of the things that's important with gabapentin is never to stop it cold turkey for two-legged or four-legged because it will cause a seizure disorder or it cause a seizure it will cause a disorder. So it does cause a seizure if you stop uh, too fast. So that's one of those drugs where you always have to taper and work with your veterinarian in this case or a doctor. Um, yeah, and that's what most people say after a year or so. It just doesn't do anything. Um, ashwagandha is an interesting herb. Uh, it is an adaptogen. It was on our list of things to talk about a little bit. Um, and Gray, feel free to, to chime in here. But our, our, our TikTok uh, culture of herbalism, unfortunately, says that uh, ashwagandha is good. I literally read this comment in the last week. Ashwagandha is good for everyone. It's the best herb and everyone should take it, um, which uh, I'm going to say pickles. I think that's what you were getting at. Like, no. Uh, <laughs> and it is good short term and it has a particular um, energetic pattern. And for any of you who are new on here, I say that that a lot. And it's the idea of how is it we can all sit in the same room and half of us are feeling hot, half of us are feeling cold. Um, and even if we, you know, if we put a thermometer in all of our mouths, we would all have about the same temperature. So it's not that the room is too hot or too cold. The way we experience our environment is different. And that includes cats. And, and so cats, uh, A, tend towards anxiety in general, I would argue. <laughs> uh, they, they truly are still kind of wild animals, even though they're uh, sweet and cuddly. Um, and they think you're trying to kill them. Uh, so th when they're uncomfortable in pain or whatever, that's going to cause some problems. Um, the problem is St. John's wort will, um, thank you, Gray. Um, and Gray, I, I have my own opinions, but feel free to type in there what you think the energetics of ashwagandha are, uh, hot, cold, wet, dry, nourishing, etc. cetera. Um, with the, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. Um, St. John's Ward definitely will interfere with gabapentin. That's not even a question. So I would not, um, I would not do St. John's Ward with that. Um, St. John's Ward is safe for cats, but what I might argue is depending on where it is, uh, I might suggest doing an oil infusion topically. So if it's in a place where the cat won't eat it, um, like on a face, head, uh, upper back where they can't turn around and lick it all off. Uh, you can do, oh, okay, never mind. They're going to lick their tail. Uh, <laughs> it was a good, it was a try. Um, I'll recommend, and you can find this on the school's website, uh, but it's available on Amazon. Uh, there's a book called Four Paws, Five Directions. Um, and with that, there's acupressure points that uh and it might also uh make some recommendations and i without double checking i won't say for sure but things like alpha lipoic acid uh, are helpful making sure there's enough essential fatty acids as well um, for the kitty cat just to help with nerve repair um, milky oats and really important that it's milky oats um, can be helpful as well for helping to recreate uh, and reduce infl nerve inflammation as well as uh, w along with that um, alpha lipoic acid and um, uh, essential fatty acids in general, the uh, milky oats will help with nerve repair. Um, so all of that together should be fine. Cats are finicky, if you will, uh, of adding new stuff into their food, but those are all things you should be able to add into their food. The trick with milky oats is making sure it's good milky oats, uh, that it's actually not oat tops. And nothing wrong with oat tops, but it's not as strong as milky oats, and it's worth investing um, for something like a nerve injury um, for that. And I will say, when you get down here, um, student clinic especially, uh, the students see critters as well. So um, there's a number of students who really enjoy seeing um, dogs and cats are primarily what we see. Um, there's somebody who may be bringing a rabbit in. I'm super excited about that. Uh, <laughs> but we've worked on snakes and bearded dragons and all kinds of others. And, well, Tabitha's on here. Chickens and goats and other weird stuff. And Tabitha's 
Uh, well, no, you're still in student clinical. We can totally make Tabitha work on, oh, you're going off to acupuncture school. We're not going to see you as much. Um, Tabitha is down in Naples, and she sees lots of critters down there because she's already got her own menagerie farm. All right. <laughs> well, there, we, we knocked off a couple there. Um, well, let's just talk about adaptogens a little bit just because we, we've said that word. And um, adaptogens are uh, a term primarily used in Western herbal medicine, and it's the concept, there's lots of different definitions of adaptogens, but in general, the short answer is adaptogens are herbs that help us adapt to stress, um, which, here's a shocker, all of us have it. Um, and the, <laughs> you're welcome, Sally. Uh, the, there's larger conversations about what else that means. So a lot of people will start to talk about adaptogens is they can be taken long term, that uh, they're generally considered safe to everybody. Um, and then there's lots of arguments about what is the actions of those adaptogens and honestly whether any of them are safe. And I've seen, and, and I've love uh, David Winston, but in his book, he wrote one of the first books on adaptogens, he put St. John's wort as an adaptogen. I'm like, no. Although St. John's wort is a very effective and safe herb, it is very narrow, A, never with uh, any prescription or over-the-counter drugs, B, it's not something you take forever necessarily, and it has that very specific window of what it's effective for. So it's it's good for, like I said, the melancholia and so forth. So I don't consider that um, something you would take forever. In the same way, you don't want to go on the all iceberg lettuce diet or the all carrot diet. Um, variety is where the magic is. And so adaptogens can be used effectively for situational stress issues. Um, you know, we're, we're going to give a big presentation. Taking adaptogens to help you adapt to the, for stress for that situation is good. You almost got in a car accident or you got in a car accident, super stressful. You need some adaptogens as you recover from all of that. Um, you've got, you know, it's the holidays and everybody's visiting, super stressful. No, uh, <laughs> that, that's the tinctures in large doses. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Bad alcohol joke, sorry. Um, so there is an endless numbers of adaptogens, but the problem is those adaptogens are now literally their um, Shazandra Berry, uh, Wu Weizhe in Chinese medicine, sorry, I'm going to type that because nobody knows what the hell I just said, is now in one of the Coca-Cola products. Um, the price, you know, I think they did that like 10, 15 years ago. And, um, and I'm not going to pretend to write Shazandra Berry because I have no idea how to spell it. Um, so adaptogens are great everything from ginseng to astragalus to um uh, and and pickles you mentioned a bunch of the mushrooms reishi mushroom and cordyceps in particular i think are great but that doesn't mean you should take them forever um if you're under that much stress you need to change something other than the herbs that you're taking um they're being put into all of our adrenal formulas uh, they're being put into all of these stress formulas and adaptogen formulas, things like ashwagandha are put into the sleep formulas, and people are taking them endlessly. And they're using it the same way I like a good cup of coffee. Like, I can, get, I can work a little bit longer. Um, I can get by with a little less sleep if I have that second cup of coffee, and especially if I take one in the afternoon. And so using things to get a little extra energy to let us handle a little bit harder workload literally is starting to just be a misuse of really great powerful herbs. So there is a time and a place for all the adaptogens. And I, I hate to say it, like, which is worse, a mushroom blend coffee or coffee itself, you know? And so, I don't know. <laughs> I like coffee. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Shazandra Berry, yes. See, I knew I wasn't gonna spell that right. I, I would have had too many consonants in there, I'm sure. Um, so one of the things to, to look at is rather than saying adaptogens are good for everybody, is to say, A, is this a short-term or long-term problem? And some people, I, I hate to say it, are you know, stuck in long-term stress situations, and that sucks. Um, but then again, just like with all the herbs, we have to match the herb with the individual. 
And a great example is reishi mushrooms really drying, has a focus on the lungs. Uh, cordyceps, another great one, has a focus on the kidneys, a little bit on the lungs, but it's moistening. So somebody who's super phlegmy, like myself, I love reishi mushroom. Cordyceps, I got to be careful. Um, and so what they're doing is they're throwing all of these mushrooms into a coffee blend. Um, as Pickles was baffling me at first, but it's like the eight mushroom blend. And I, there's all of these national companies that are doing great marketing and raise the price of all the mushrooms now. Um, but the reality is all they're doing is taking the popular herbs and throwing them in a bucket. Uh, and I have, I'm not sure yet. Mushrooms are, have to be processed uniquely. They have to be cooked. Um, when I tell people to do uh, mushrooms in something like a bone broth to recover from chemotherapy or childbirth or something, I actually encourage them to cook, to simmer or boil it for as long as humanly possible. Because to get through the hard exterior and get to the, um, the polysaccharides and so forth, the good stuff that's in there, that has to be heated and broken down. And so although I love some button mushrooms in a salad, that's just good fiber. Um, you're not getting any benefits from an uncooked mushroom. So it has to be processed with heat in order to get those benefits. And so somebody grinding up some uh, mushrooms and basically pouring hot water on it does absolutely no good other than to line the pockets of the person doing it. Um, so to get those benefits from mushrooms, get the right ones um, and get make sure that they're processed long enough to get the benefits out of it. Um, with the other adaptogens, again, look to energetics. What's the specific indications uh, or imbalances? And so there's not a one size fits all. Um, you know, ginseng's a good example of that. American ginseng's more cooling, Chinese ginseng's more warming. Um, the Eleutherococcus, which is Siberian ginseng, is not a ginseng, is super dry. Uh, and it's, it's so funny, I always see, I've literally seen medical journals that say, ginseng, it was research about ginseng unspecified no latin name no american chinese or siberian is good for menopause and another one that said it was good for diabetes where i would say the american ginseng yes the chinese ginseng no and the siberian ginseng never uh, and so yes thank you oh hey <laughs> um so it is really important and you know not to say like yes come to herb school and learn all this stuff the the reality is that information's out there um, and so the hardest part is for if most of us are using herbs to just treat ourselves for situational stuff. That's very normal. Colds and flu and sinuses and all the usual day-to-day -day crap, stress being one of the day-to-day -day crap things. Um, and so for us to recognize our imbalance, it's hard to analyze yourself. Like, yes, we're all introspective and think we know ourselves. We also delude ourselves really well. And so to recognize what's hot, what part's out of whack, how are we being affected? Um, that is the purpose of an herbalist. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy to say over the last 20 years, I've produced a lot of good herbalists out there running around. Uh, and I generally don't take new patients. So go see one of the other herbalists that are out there. Uh, we got good ones at the clinic, come to the student clinic, all of that. Um, but really, even if you just do it once every year or so to get a, where am I out of balance? How am I out of whack? Um, and none of us are in balance because we are in a state of constant flux and change and recognizing that how we eat, um, how we eliminate uh, our stressors, our activities, the seasonal changes that are normal, like especially I, I'm going to say this for anybody who lives up north, watermelon is not yummy in the middle of winter when there's three feet of snow on the ground. That sucks, right? We want warm tea, we want soups, we want uh, those things that warm and nourish and give us calories, not things that cool and moisten our body. Uh, and so recognizing that how do we change our dietary habits as the seasons change? And here in Florida, admittedly, it's wet and dry, it's or cool and not cold, um, but we do. We have a, a, a wet season, we have a dry season, we have pollen seasons like that's next month, I think, is our oak pollen starts to paint our cars for a month or two. Um, and so if we can figure out our imbalances and how that shows up, um, then we can more effectively choose and change our 
exercise habits, our food habits, and especially our herb habits to include our adaptogens. Um, so don't let it be said that adaptogens are, Bob never said adaptogens are bad. Bob said they were overused and inappropriately used and we were just throwing all the herbs into a bucket, stirring them up and hoping for the best. And that's not good herbal medicine. Um, it's funny, I, I've had a, a couple of people just in the last five years, I think, who literally, and I was so impressed because I've talked always about how do we change our, our exercise and our diet habits. I literally make different trauma, physical trauma, uh, dit dot jiao in Chinese, um, formulas based on seasons. We have different forms of exercise and different forms of injuries that happen in the summertime. But once it cools off, we all think we're still superstars that we can all play tennis and football and do all of these activities and we get injured a lot and in Chinese medicine in particular, we see how what the weather is when we got an injury will affect the nature of that injury over time. And sorry, you know, Pickles, you know, you said you busted a shoulder. Like that would, um, ooh, yes, thank you, duh. <laughs> we wanted to do a deep dive on that um, and a little bit more organized. And everybody has to remember, I'm doing these off the top of my head. <laughs> so, um, so literally, how do I change this topical liniment based on our seasonal injuries will change our outcomes. And it doesn't mean it won't work, but it works better. But I had these couple of uh, clients recently who they changed to both their, uh, actually they were yoga practitioners, they changed their yogic practices, their exercise practices, and their eating habits uh, based on their menstrual cycle. And I thought that was brilliant um, for, for women who are menstruating um, that what their body needs based on where they are in their cycle is so dramatically different. Oh yes, I totally will, good question. Um, wild edibles. Sorry, I'm, I'm all I was like, I had a list. I was like, I'm liking the questions even more and I'll get around to all of them at some point. Um, <clears throat> all right, I did those. Um, wild edibles, I'm totally want to do that one now. So I, I was really lucky. I just was um, on the uh, Little Manatee River um, with Gray uh, this afternoon. <laughs> it's a late start. Um, and... I hadn't been on that river since last March, I think. Um, cool. <laughs> that's that's an entire class, cat. <laughs> but I'll, I'll see if I can't do that. Uh, I need to do my, I, it's been 15 years since I did a topical one. Uh, I need to do that again. Somewhere I have all my stuff for that. Um, so. It, it was interesting seeing the river uh, only three months different from the last time I was on there, and yet what we saw in bloom, uh, things we saw and didn't see were dramatically different. And I noticed uh, I got here to the classroom a little bit early um, this afternoon um, to walk around uh, because we got that market coming up on, wait, when was it? January 6th, yes, Friday, January 6th, uh, literally a week away from 7 to 11. Um, and uh, like I, I'm gonna do a nighttime herb walk for the first time ever, um, and that's free by the way. Uh, and I was like, oh, I need to see what's gonna available and try to label a few things so people can kind of do a self-guided. And one of the things that I'm just, and, and this is unique for this area, um, uh, if you go south, it's gonna be different. Cat on the east coast, I'm sure it's gonna be different. Uh, if we go north, it's gonna be a little bit different. But I'm just seeing the poor man's pepper starting to come up. Um, and that's uh, Lepidium virginicus, and it's the Chinese herb. Oops, where's my typey thing? Oh no, write a comment, there we go. Ah, Ting Li Zi uh, is poor man's pepper. Uh, that's just starting to pop up. So for those of you who are really good at your plan ID, you can start to see it um, as it comes up and it's doing it, the flower and seed pods haven't started to materialize. So you have to look a little bit more carefully. I'm also seeing our uh, Florida plantain starting to come up and it looks so distinctly different uh, from the Plantago uh, officinalis, or yeah, it's, I think it's officinalis. Um, or no, it's Plantago major is the herb of commerce and 
I forget what our uh, what species we have, but our species has a more narrow leaf. Uh, yeah, more narrow leaf. It's furrier than the plantago major. So not plantain the banana, but plantain the weed on the ground. And it has, they haven't started to shoot out their center spike yet. So it'll get a spike about yay high um, with like lots of little seeds at the top. Um, and that's both a great medicinal as well as a, um, a great culinary herb. It tends to be a little dirty. Um, so it's low to the ground. So it's got lots of sand on there. Um, in our yard back here are um, uh, Florida Betony, um, Stachys floridata is really look it's like this high and i'm gonna say we're probably a month from getting starting to be able to harvest some roots uh it's not native but i got my motherwort uh is popping everywhere we just potted up like i think 15 plants of that that were volunteers um this is also uh, a great time to harvest the goldenrod uh, the seeds of that. So if you don't have goldenrod, as you walk around, you might still find a few yellow flowers depending on the different species. Um, and so the goldenrod, phenomenal, A, pretty, bees love them, um, but also a great medicinal. It's highly underutilized. Um, the goldenrod seeds are on there. So you'll see these kind of grayish bundles of uh, of it almost looks a little bit like dandelion, but it'll be a long, uh, long stem that, you know, if you're walking through uh, roadside, not nobody would take that from a park. That would be illegal um, and accidentally ran your hand along it and took up a handful of those and stuck them in your pocket. Um, you could literally spread those into your yard so that next season those will start to pop. I think by July or August, they were already looking great. And I know I... I think goldenrod's great. I plan to start. We have it in the clinic, but I'm going to uh, harvest some here uh, to put in uh, for sale that we've grown ourselves. Um, but I literally, for the last month, I've been going around taking those seed pods and throwing them all over the yard, uh, the yard here at the school. What other interesting things are out there? Um, I think those are the biggies I've seen um, on the canoe trip. We ooh wait, uh, I harvested some black root that uh, that I plan to plant um, but this is the good time to harvest this so it's the root part of this we use um, I've also heard this called colic root and so some of these uh, sorry I'm gonna make a mess sorry whoever ends up cleaning that up um, this is a beautiful one this was a big one that I got um, and so I can separate this and get Try not to spill dirt on my computer. I can separate this and probably make six plants. I've got two growing here. Uh, and this puts up a, we talk about uh, Florida Betony, the rattlesnake root. This one has the rattlesnake flower. And so it gets this really cool kind of whitish gray flower. Um, these are now going dormant and you can see the underside of the leaf. So the top is uh, green underside is silvery um, and this is definitely medicine not food I'm gonna break one off yeah, you can't really see it hopefully I will not cut my hand open here so when you harvest roots it's usually and so it's got this very black interior so that's cut into it oh, you can smell it it's very, uh, see, there's benefits to showing up here. Nobody ever comes to see it in person. You get to smell and taste any weird shit I have, <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. You smell that resinous mm -hmm. kind of smell in there? Yeah, it's super strong. Um, so that's used for all kinds of interesting things, but uh, it's used for cough in particular. Hopefully that'll oh. still grow. Um, and that is a Florida native plant. Um, and yeah, if you've got betony, like go, it, and it's nice because if, you can find it wild. Uh, it likes well-drained but wetter um, soil, so a place that's close to the water but it grows in full sun. Um, and it has those classic, uh, it is in the mint family, the Laminaceae family. Um, and so it's got the square stem, the alternating opposite leaves, and then the leaves themselves have kind of that um, uh, 
toothed or serrated um, edge. And uh, I think they're just starting to go into flower here. And so the very classic kind of, if you've ever grown basil, it has the, those very unique flowers in it. And remember, A, in another month or so, we can start harvesting the roots. They're usually in their prime, like June. Um, you'll find them like as long as your hand. Uh, those are great medicine. They're good food. You can pickle them, eat them fresh, chop them up in a salad or a stir fry. Um, but the leaves and stem are also a, a nervine uh, adaptogen. And so it's one of the few mints that isn't aromatic. It doesn't have a lot of volatile oils. Uh, but that Florida betony is um, wonderful for stress. It's funny, I, and Tabitha, you know, you're, you're young and will attest to this if she's there. She was having a really rough day in class. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Hi, Felicity. Uh, I, I'm so sorry for you or anybody else who's in the, <laughs> the cold there. Uh, yeah, it, it was probably close to 80 degrees today out on the river canoeing and saw all kinds of crazy flowers. Um, the, um, but I, I, I had uh, your child, uh, after a hard day in class, she was like, I got to drive home. I can't deal. And I want to say it was a little another month from now. And I was like, go out. You know where the betony patch is out here and dig up three roots and eat them. And, uh, and I think I had her eat the leaves as well. And by the time she walked back in, you know, she was like, okay, I'm good. And it's like, it can be that powerful. And thinking of the roots, the roots as more nourishing and grounding. Um, and then the aerial part, and I would say specifically for nerves, I assume you can feed it to a cat, um, but the, it wouldn't be wrong for uh, any kind of uh, nerve issue as well. And the aerial parts I like more for um, that stress, um, uh, frazzled nerves, especially if there's a little bit of phlegm. That's all I can think of. <laughs> uh, and as long as I said the word mint and stuff, let me get to get to one of the questions somebody wrote on here, actually. <laughs> um, and she was asking a lot of, somebody emailed this in and asked a lot of questions about digestion and that she's been doing a lot of work on digestion. And I'm going to say that is stress and digestion are the two main complaints I get from folks. Um, and I'm going to say they're the same. So a lot of our chronic digestive problems are caused by stress. Um, and so a lot of our adaptogens that we use to help us adapt to stress, a lot of our nervines, things that soothe those nerves, um, <laughs> you're welcome, uh, can be super helpful for both digestive issues as well as stress issues. Um, I, I am the prime example of all of us have our own unique ways that stress shows up. Some people it's headaches, some people it's their shoulders. Um, some, me, it shows up in my belly. Like the more stressed I am, the more digestive issues I have, the more bloating, um, that, that's primarily it. Um, so when we're looking, and she was asking specifically about acid reflux, and, and it's so funny, I, I need to like, do like an hour just on acid reflux and just leave it up on the YouTube page for everybody to uh, to look at. Um, because besides the chronic things like IBS um, and uh, autoimmune disorders like ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, things like that, one of, the, I, I'm gonna say in the top 10 prescription medications, your acid reflux meds are in the top 10 most commonly prescribed medications. Um, and there's the problem is, is although they sometimes work, um, they're not addressing, uh, <laughs> you got it, um, they're not addressing the underlying cause. And certainly poor food choices can be one of those. <laughs> um, but the other one is more often than not, low stomach acid is the, and I've, I've babbled about this a little bit in the past, but we'll, we'll try to do a little bit deeper dive here tonight. Oh my God, it's almost seven o'clock already. Ah. Um, so acid reflux can come from um, a physical uh, issue, a hiatal hernia. Um, it can come from low stomach acid or it can come from high stomach acid. There's some other less common things like um, 
uh, gastroparesis that can cause that as well. Um, but when we look at the most common one, uh, Western medicine does not recognize low stomach acid, unfortunately. No matter what, if you say acid reflux, they're either going to give you a PPI, um, which is a proton pump inhibitor, or an H2 blocker, which is a histamine blocker. Um, uh, <laughs> and the reality is, when we look at those types of drugs, and it's funny, this came up in a conversation today on the river, because all I do is talk about this crap. Um, that and i've struggled with this as well so if somebody and very normal like you go in you have acid reflux it's keeping you up at night it's causing pain they give you an endoscope and they go oh my god you have barrett's esophagus or you've got inflammation in your esophagus it's going to turn to barrett's esophagus you're going to have esophageal cancer tomorrow um, they don't look to see whether you have high or low stomach acid they just automatically put you on those acid reflux meds and they don't ever take you off you stay on those for the rest of your life. There is zero, insert big goose egg, research on the long-term effects past one year on the effects of those medications. And one of the problems is stopping those causes acid reflux. So if it's generally controlling your acid reflux um, and you're taking them like two or three times a day and you stop them, it will make the acid reflux worse than it ever was because it was kind of like it was holding back the dam and you took it away and it goes, you know, we've all done that with a hose or a water fountain. That's basically what happens to your acid production. And I never really thought about it much and, and I, I kind of thought through it on, on the river. They're stopping those specialized cells in your stomach from the production of acid, the hydrochloric acid that belongs in your stomach. And you can still add hydrochloric acid in a tablet uh, in a pill form in order to raise it up as you taper off of those acid reflux meds and yes here's my i am not a pharmacist nor the prescribing physician make sure that you work with your uh, pharmacist and md who has no idea how to get you off of those medications but work with them and i recommend tapering uh, when you do it um, and if necessary use uh, uh, some sort of combination of carminatives things that settle the stomach but also um, some moistening, soothing things um, like slippery elm or marshmallow root or deglycerized licorice. Um, and you can, whoops, there we go. And those can be used until you get off of it. As a general rule, if you get acid when your stomach's empty, like you go, you wake up in the morning, you have acid reflux, and you're standing there waiting in line to get your coffee at Starbucks, and you have acid reflux, you might have high stomach acid, or there might be a hiatal hernia that can be literally, I'll explain that in a minute, uh, fixed manually. Um, but if you get acid reflux with food, if you get acid reflux when you lay down, um, chances are pretty darn good. Um, that you have low stomach acid and the treatment is to actually raise the uh, raise the stomach acid uh, in in your stomach with hydrochloric acid you can buy that over the counter there's nothing special there um, taking it with food if you make your acid worse then I'm wrong if you feel nothing or you see an improvement in your acid reflux then you have low stomach acid the problem with the long-term use of the PPIs and the H2 blockers, uh, and for that matter, just things like Tums, long-term, they block your ability. You need stomach acid. Like, it is a vital resource in your body. Um, it breaks down all of your proteins so that it breaks it down into amino acids so that your body can utilize protein, whether it's a plant protein or a meat protein. doesn't matter. You need that. It's necessary for the absorption for, uh, of B12, and so we see long-term people end up anemic. It is also necessary uh, to absorb your minerals. And so think all the calcium, magnesium, potassium, all of those cool things that are necessary for your nerve function to regulate your heartbeat, uh, your blood pressure, um, build strong bones. All of that is dependent on your ability to absorb and utilize uh, your stomach acid. It also sterilizes your food, for lack of a better name. Uh, so if you're, yay, iceberg lettuce and, and sprouts, good for you, right? Okay, maybe not the iceberg lettuce, but we eat that. It's, if we're eating raw food in particular, it's covered with 
yeast, bacteria, fungus, whatever, even if you don't see it, even if you wash it, it's got some little critters the second it got, you know, it was there, it had that. And if you chew it up, the digestive enzymes that are part of your spit, and then ultimately it goes into the, the big vat of acid, the hydrochloric acid in your stomach, and it will kill all of that stuff. So it protects us from things like food poisoning and all of those not so good probiotic or bacteria in there that might cause problems. So if we suppress our stomach acid uh, or we have low stomach acid, we're at an increased risk of E. coli, um, C. diff, which is a bacterial infection that can be deadly, um, and various other fun food poisonings, and will over time throw off the uh, good healthy bacteria that are in our gut. Um, and so you can take all the probiotics in the world, but if we're not protecting our gut from all the foreign invaders that don't belong in there with our stomach acid, we end up with problems. So, sorry, and, and I'm like, this is, I, I have not put it on this schedule yet, but one of the things I was asked by my students, they hear about all these cool classes I do at conferences, and they're like, well, why don't we get in that class? So I'm going to find a weekend sometime in the next six months to do like segments of all the cool classes I've taught. One of them was a three or four hour class on HCL specifically, and that was for acupuncture. So was, I'm going to do the short version here. Um, the, the reality is when we're under stress, we have these different phases of digestion. So there's the cephalic phase of digestion, which means it's Pavlov's dog. You know, the Pavlov's dog, they would ring the bell, the dogs would start to salivate because they recognize food was coming. We do the same thing when, you know, you get, you're over at grandma's house and she's cooking a big holiday dinner or whatever. And you're like, you smell the cooking all day long, the sounds, the smells and all of that. And so we're literally starving an hour before food. And that starts 20% of our digestive function is just from our seeing, smelling, tasting, or seeing and smelling and hearing the process of cooking. Um, and calling up Uber Eats does not engage 20% of our digestive system because it just shows up at our door and we start stuffing it in our pie hole. Putting it in the microwave for three minutes and waiting for the ding is not the same as spending an hour. So that concept of slow food is so important. Um, uh, propranol every day. Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, you're my poster child for that, Felicity. <laughs> um, not even a question. Um, and so the other thing is we hear about, we talk about fight or flight. We all do that. You know, the saber-toothed tiger is chasing us down the street. And I'm here to tell you that if you're being chased by saber-toothed tigers, <laughs> there's a serious problem, um, but our... <laughs> Our life is a bunch of small saber-toothed tigers. It's our bills, it's our family, it's our job. All of those are endless stress that we don't get to sit around the campfire at night. And the least important thing when you're being chased by a, uh, a, a danger is digestion and elimination. So guess what happens? Your stomach and all your peristalsis, the, the, your, the contraction of your bowels that moves your poop along, that ceases to function. The production of stomach acid, vomiting on saber-toothed tigers does not stop them from eating your face. So our ability to produce the stomach acid when we're under nonstop long-term stress stops. And so, yep, you're a stressful day, whatever, nobody cares. But when you're on endless stress year after year after year, that starts to impact our body just shuts down its digestive system. And that's part of that vagus nerve is responsible for our digestion, respiration, all these other cool things. Um, and the part, and I think we've talked about this in past um, episodes of this, um, the, we talk about the vagus nerve and the sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, um, but we, we look at the vagal tone, the strength of the function of your vagus nerve to put us in the opposite of fight or flight. The opposite being rest, relax, digest, and actually reproduce because our sexual function and our hormones all start to decline because your ability to uh, have sex is again unimportant if you're being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger um, and so finding it, it it's it, it always sounds so stupid belly breathing and go for a walk and exercise and a nice cup of chamomile tea literally you know yoga tai chi whatever it is those things actually have a dramatic impact on our ability to continue with that and, and Kristen you you actually said like doesn't our stomach acid decline yes it does just like all our secretions do like shit declines as we age and yet 
I was watching some, I surf YouTube too and, and Facebook and all that. And I saw this episode, some people went to, I think it was Sardinia, was one of those blue zones where people live, uh, a ridiculous number of people live past 100. And they had some 100 year old woman in there and she still ate normal meals. Like most of us are no longer like, oh, I'll, I, so many people in their 80s say like, I can eat cheese and crackers, that's my meal for the day and maybe a sip of soup. I was like, that's not enough to sustain life. And so for people who live in these blue zones and what they're Okinawa, there's all these places where they have strong community, they ride their bike, they grow food locally, they have a low stress environment in every day of their life. And that allows for a small natural decline of our stomach acid. But at 100 years old, you're still eating healthy and you're still eating meals, maybe that much less as opposed to a life of, you know, trying to sustain on cheese and crackers. Um, so yes, there is a decline, um, but it should not be the dramatic decline that we see our elderly all dropping dead of C. diff. Like as I'm not gonna say a leading cause of death, but it's one of the main causes of hospital deaths because they catch it in the hospitals. And at some point it just dehydrates and kills them way too fast. So um, that was a long way around. So if you're, acid reflux is aggravated with food in your stomach, you have low stomach acid. No questions asked. If, if it's aggravated when your stomach's empty, you potentially have high stomach acid. And if, uh, a, oops, you can't see it there. So diaphragm, diaphragm, dome-shaped muscle here, and your, your esophagus passes through there and goes up, that's your mouth, and then your stomach's, oops, there we go. There's, that's my esophagus. This is my stomach, right? And so heavy weight lifting, pregnancy, overweight, bending over too much, sometimes pushes the stomach up through the diaphragm and causes acid reflux. The treatment for that is not to reduce stomach acid, but put the stomach back where it belongs. Chiropractors know how to do this. Um, you can do it yourself, laying on your back with your knees bent, relaxes your abdomen. Here's the bottom ribs, xiphoid process, sternum, like that. And so you go right below the xiphoid process, you stick your thumbs in, not uncomfortably, just like, okay, I feel something, and you pull down, boop, boop, and you do that as many times as you can, and that will usually fix it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and it, it's, I've always known about low stomach acid as being a potential problem. Um, the MDs don't really have a test for it that they'll do, and so it's unfortunate. They don't, they're not testing for high stomach acid. All they're seeing is a symptom, acid reflux, or the endoscope doesn't test anything. It just looks and says, oh, look, inflammation. Um, and the reason we get the acid reflux with low stomach acid, the esophageal sphincter, we call it a valve, but it's really just, it's a, a couple of muscles that push together. Oops, there we go, it's down here. Uh, <laughs> and there is a trigger to make things open and close. Low stomach acid relaxes the sphincter. High stomach acid closes it. So when your stomach acid is low, it's open because there's no reason to close it if it's low. Um, and then you lay down and some of the digestive food from your stomach runs up and causes an issue. Um, we also see if your mineral absorption is lowered because of low stomach acid, we can see nerve dysfunction from the physical, like neuropathy, um, uh, irregular heartbeat, uh, tachycardia, bradycardia. Um, but we'll also see depression. That's more of that energetic idea when we're unnourished, we're melancholy, depressed, a little blue. Um, we see fatigue. Uh, and so some people say they have silent reflux. They'll oftentimes have uh, either a unexplainable chronic cough, a weak cough, depression, and chronic sinusitis. And what it is, it's those fumes coming from literally the rotting food because it's not breaking down properly, coming up through the open esophagus, irritating the mucous membranes of the nose and the lungs. And then the long-term effects of that um, are oftentimes um, the malabsorption, so we'll get the depression from a lack of your B vitamins and your minerals. Huh. And all you need is HCL. <laughs> it's the simple fix. Um, the, the other part of that is, oh, I've seen more. I, I used to be once a year I'd see somebody with low HCL. It was 
very rare. Um, since COVID, and I'm not blaming it on COVID, I'm not blaming it on the vaccine, I'm blaming it on the huge amount of stress every single person in our society has had for the last four years. Um, and that stress on top of our normal stuff, I think is su shut down. It has been an endless saber tooth tiger um, that we haven't recovered from that yet. And it's shut down our ability to produce an HCL. And that, that's Bob's personal opinion rather than like based in fact. Um, but I've never seen it the way I've seen it now to the point where I, I rant endlessly about it. Um, long way around of that. Uh, the other part of that question, oh, and I said DGL. Um, so licorice is great. It's a um, mucilaginous herb, very soothing to the stomach. Um, the problem is, is long-term use of licorice, especially in higher doses, uh, will cause, um, potentially cause a potassium imbalance in your kidneys, causing hypertension, high blood pressure. So it's the glycerin, which is a chemical that is in licorice, um, that you can remove that and still get the moistening, soothing of mucous membrane effects from that, even if you remove that aspect that throws off the blood pressure. So you can buy a product called DGL, um, deglycerized licorice at the health food store or wherever, um, and use that if you're tapering off of your acid reflux medication. So it gives some relief uh, from that pretty effectively. And like I said, mixing that with things like um, marshmallow is easier to work with than slippery elm. There's a longer version of uh, slippery elm. Oh, wait, and I have to do my station identification. For anybody who's just jumping on, it looks like we got it. I see new names today, and I really like seeing new names. Um, if you don't know it, I'm Bob Lindy. I'm a uh, registered herbalist and acupuncture physician here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And uh, I run the uh, Herb School, Tradition School of Herbal Studies, which has a fall away from beginner to uh, clinical practitioner in both Chinese and Western herbal medicine, two separate tracks, as well as lots of other cool standalone classes like Ayurvedic medicine, um, uh, just kind of getting to know our local plants, herb walks, uh, anatomy for the herbalist, for all those people who've forgotten all of their sciences from when they were back in the day, as well as a clinical practice with some freaking awesome herbalists and acupuncture physicians. And you can find out more about the Herb School at traditionsherbschool.com. And the clinical practice, as well as our ongoing student clinic at acuherbals.com, 1C in acuherbals. Uh, and we've got lots of cool classes this January 1st at 9 a.m. at Forest Bluff Park in South St. Pete. We're doing a, I'm doing a free herb walk at 9 a.m. And our full moon market, our first uh, market here is January 6th. And I'll be doing a free herb walk with that to bring all you people out to support all the awesome vendors. If you're a vendor, please reach out to Tracy at the full moon uh, market. Uh, and January 6th, it's all over Facebook. And that weekend is also the uh, Western Herbal 101, uh, January 6th and 7th, uh, excuse me, January 7th and 8th, Saturday and Sunday, from 10 to 5. And that is the start of the Western Herbal program. We'll do a couple more of those, but there's still room in that class. And on Saturday, January 7th, the AHG West Coast chapter will be reconstituted by our very own graduate, Shannon. Uh, and so please come out, whether you're an HG member or not, please come out and support it and meet your herbal community and do some brainstorming with her to do all kinds of other cool stuff. Uh, oh, oh, I'm so glad you made it there, Sheila. And now, oh, good. And you know, it's always funny. I always feel like the, hey, Batty, I see all these people jumping on. I didn't know we're here. God. <laughs> Boy, I'm going to have to send you all a check in the mail for all of the uh, positive comments here. All right. That's enough of that. Um, so DGL is a good part of that and other carminatives. And one of the questions, sorry, get back around to my list of good, good questions here, was about using mint for uh, digestive issues, bloating, gas, uh, dyspepsia is the $5 word for that, uh, and even acid reflux. And so what you get is very mixed reviews. Mint works for some people, it doesn't work for others. It actually uh, aggravates any of the mints, and uh, pamper mints worse than regular uh, field mint, but all of them can aggravate acid reflux. And so here's the trick. Um, mint, uh, and when I say mint, I think all of the mints, um, there is, it's one of those really cool herbs that based on how you prepare it and the dosage of it will change its actions. And we have a number of, you know, when we look at herbs, 
Sometimes the plant part will have a different action. Things like yarrow, we have flower, leaf, and root has very distinctly different actions. Mint, the higher the dosage the, and the longer, make sure I'm saying it right, the longer the steep, it becomes diaphoretic. Um, and so it will make you break a sweat. And we use it for colds and flu specifically for that. And all of your air, and I'm, there's exceptions to this, but I'm gonna say all of your mints that are strong aromatics like um, uh, peppermint and um, uh, regular mint have an upward energy because of the volatile oils, right? So that wonderful smell, and we, especially with fresh mint, it's like, ooh, and those permeate up. When we do a long, steep, or a high dose, it is strong enough and warm enough to make us um, break out in a sweat. When we use a low dose, it will, and sorry, I'm going to cheat and say, um, <laughs> oh, uh, a low dose with a short steep has two functions. One is to help move chi and that idea of feeling stuck. And that was one of the questions she was like, what do you do when the, 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 belly, the abdomen is feeling like bloated and stuck. Um, so it, it can be part of regulating or moving that digestive energy, if you will. But it's also drying. And so <clears throat> for somebody who has a thick, greasy tongue coating, uh, sinusy, phlegmy, then any of those mints are good because it will also kind of like diffuse and di disperse through that phlegm and break things up. For somebody who has no coating on their tongue, tends towards constipation or really dry, it will actually aggravate them. And so we have a good muco, hopefully we have a good mucosal lining, right? So we have this slimy coating around our stomachs that stomach acid isn't supposed to go through. And um, when it dries up in an area, we call that an ulcer. So if somebody has a dry coating where they're starting to get maybe some hot spots in the stomach itself, or they tend towards dry, putting that drying, dispersing mints on any of them will aggravate that. And so if you're going to do, like for me, I could drink mint, mint tea till the cows come home. I love it because it's a part of what's good for stress and I'm a phlegm fest, especially when I don't eat right. I tend towards low stomach acid. I need to take my HCL occasionally, especially for heavy protein meals. It's very important to, for me. So for me, it's great. For somebody who's really got that red skin, dry skin, red tongue, no coat, um, tends to get night sweats or hot flashes, very likely it will um, aggravate their condition, especially if they do it a lot you can counteract it and that's the joy of formulation. So if we're like, yeah, but I want that dispersing action of the mint and it's a good carminative calming to the stomach, but they're tending towards dry, we can mix it with marshmallow. Um, and so we can alter the ratios. Of, and that's really like, sorry, that's why you go to school and learn formulation. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's really the trick of understanding those concepts of herbs that are warming, herbs that are cooling, herbs that are moistening and uh, nourishing and those that are drying and, and potentially draining. Uh, and, and so we look at, when we talk this idea of energetics, we say hot, cold, wet, dry, deficient, excess, intense, and lax. Um, and so recognizing how <clears throat> a cold, lax disorder shows up will be different in everybody. That can be a flemminess. That can be loose stools with undigested food. Uh, that can be easy sweating with exertion where tense, uh, a tense condition can be neck and shoulder pain where you're walking around like this. Um, that can be caused from stress. It can cause alternating constipation and diarrhea. It can cause an irregular menses. Uh, it can cause no menses. So how do we recognize the difference between a tense disorder affecting menstruation versus a deficient, like a blood deficient disorder affecting both cause no menses. 
One's not letting go. The other one, there's nothing to let go. And so how do we recognize and differentiate that to more effectively, um, <laughs> way to go, Gray. Um, and, and so if we can recognize deficiency versus excess, tense versus lax, then once we understand the nature of the disharmony of the individual, it allows us to better choose those herbs and put them together. Um, and that, that A, requires a little study. <laughs> okay, a lot of study. Um, but also experience. And so for somebody to point to you like, oh, this is what this tongue looks like in this condition. This is what this pulse feels like. This is, you know, different types of diarrhea. I, I sorry, I, literally our Chinese group, sorry, it's only for our Chinese students. Uh, it's called poop and liver. Um, because liver, we talk to about stress uh, and poop tells us everything. We don't, you know, for thousands of years, we had to ask people questions, look at their tongue, their pulse, what they present to us externally to understand the nature of disease, to put herbs together. Now we have things like stool samples and blood work, which is great. New information adds to what we know. But if any of you have ever had food poisoning where you had diarrhea versus somebody who maybe took antibiotics and has diarrhea, one has smell, yucky, evacuate the house, right? From food poisoning, something died versus now I have a deficient lax condition, we have loose stools that doesn't actually have an odor. It might have undigested food. We don't have the energy to actually process the salad greens anymore. And so recognizing like literally asking embarrassing questions like your shit stink, uh, <laughs> tell us the directions that we take with all of this. Uh, and so um, somebody who has an excess of heat will have constipation. So will somebody who is anemic because they have a deficiency of the moistening, cooling liquids that we call blood. Um, and so one we nourish, one we clear the heat. And to do the opposite actually causes harm. Uh, and that's why we sometimes say like, herbs don't work. It's like, nope, Oop, TikTok doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm, one of my favorite rants. I'm horrified at the things that they say on TikTok sometimes. Um, Oh, and there was a, a question of using artemisia um, as she was trying to steer away from peppermint and mints in general because that was causing an aggravation for the person she was working with and asked about artemisia. And so there are many artemisias, um, everything from mugwort to wormwood. And opinions vary. Um, mugwort in particular um, has a, is considered warming has a better effect on the uterus. It is bitter. All, I, wanna, I, I always like to have to stop and like analyze what I'm saying when I say that all the Artemisias are bitter. I'm going to say, I think they are. Um, but some of the Artemisias are cooling, some are warming. Um, wormwood, and I've seen different opinions on wormwood, uh, usually is thought to be cooler. And is obviously wormwood. It's used as an antiparasitic. Nothing wrong with that. A little bit of an artemisia um, goes a long way and makes for a good digestive bitter. Um, and for somebody who doesn't have a gallbladder um, or has a poorly functioning gallbladder, then digestive bitters, and there are lots of different ones, although artemisias are sometimes added to it, not always. Um, and what I would say, wormwood's a common one. Um, that's probably the most common one to use. Mugwort less so because it will bring on the menses. So for women, it can be challenging, never with pregnancy. Uh, it, it is a, um, oh, there's a cool word for it that brings on the menses that just left my brain. Um, and so uh, never want to use that with pregnancy and it can throw the uh, rhythm of the cycle off a little bit to use mugwort and um, it does enhance dreaming uh, you're not going to get hallucinogens but you do get some interesting dreams with the overuse of mugwort so if you're taking a little um, digestive bitter with mugwort in it prior to going to bed you might have exciting dreams that night uh, so i i do limit the use of that um, any bitter herb can be used as a digestive bitter. And again, matching it up with the 
hot, cold, wet, dry will have the best success. <laughs> Thank you, a <Memagogue. laughs> It's like I, it's in my brain. I kept trying to say menorrhea, but the, no, that's not right. Uh, <laughs> Memagogue is brings on the menses. Uh, and so you never want to do that, obviously, if somebody's pregnant or potentially pregnant, or if they're out of cycle, you never want to use a memagogue uh, in a case like that. So yeah, you can use artemisias. I tend to go gentler with that. Um, I'm a huge fan of digestive bitters for stimulating the pancreas, the digestive enzymes from the pancreas, and the um, bile secretions in the gallbladder or out of the liver. The liver produces bile, the gallbladder stores it. So if you don't have a gallbladder, you still have bile. Um, you just don't store it. So bile is used to uh, break down fats. Um, and so if you find that you can have one potato chip with some guacamole and be fine, but if you do a bunch, you end up with loose stools, bloating, diarrhea, or nausea, um, then A, you may not have a gallbladder, but you also probably need some digestive bitters to uh, right before, usually about 10 to 15 minutes prior to a meal, a digestive bitter is great. Um, but again, match it to the energetics. Um, I, I, I make my own, but if you're like, yeah, I ain't doing that. Um, Urban Moonshine, uh, who uh, I love their digestive bitters and they break them down as warming, cooling, nourishing, and so forth. So you can put a lot of your herbs that are appropriate for an individual into a digestive bitter to get more value out of, you know, go take something, get the most value you can. And I know in a lot of, for a lot of people, mealtime is stressful whether it's a time when confrontation happens with kids or adults um, or they're eating at their desk in a stressful environment. So I always think it's digestive bitters is just yes, it's always good. <laughs> There's always value to a digestive bitter, but matching it up with the individual. And you know, you don't want to, it, it used to be our food would contain that. So our salad would contain, uh, contain things like the first course would have endive in there, which is a really intensely bitter green, or you would do a, a before dinner drink that was uh, a bitter aperture. There we go. I can't talk today. Um, so we don't do that anymore. We throw a burrito in the microwave and we stuff our pie hole and, so, and throw some sour cream on that sucker. Um, so it, it is important that we wake up the gallbladder and the pancreas to prepare for the reception of the food. Um, I think Gray would back me up if we think about the Agni and um, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, the digestive fire. We have to kind of, we got a pilot light. We need to wake it up. Uh, thank you. <laughs> um, for the reception of the food and, you know, making sure that we do that correctly for somebody. So I generally prefer the digestive, a warming digestive bitter or a stress related digestive bitter. Um, and we can do that like right before the meal, like the 10, 15 minutes before the meal, you do it like a, uh, a little, I, I like it a spray bottle, it becomes a, um, a breath freshener, if you will, but that wakes up the digestion. We start our meal and then we take our, our um, HCL if it's necessary. Not everybody needs it, so it's not a one size fits all on that. Um, all right, where'd I leave off? Ah, okay, let's do this one. I got, uh, I got 20, 30 minutes, okay. Um, Actually, let me do a, a brief plug. So I mentioned uh, at the break and at the start of all of this um, about the American Herbalist Guild and our local chapter of that. So the American Herbalist Guild is our professional organization uh, for herbalists and anybody can join. Um, you don't have to have some formal training and there's, for people who are actively enrolled in an herbal program, can join as a student member, it's a couple bucks cheaper. Uh, if you're like, herbs are cool, I like reading about herbs, or you're a practicing herbalist, you can join as a general member. It's like five or $10 more. And then if you're really completely insane, you do what uh, some of us have done, and you get the registered herbalist or RH after your name. And that's for people who um, want to be recognized as a professional herbalist. And so nobody needs that designation in order to be a, a great practitioner and so forth but it is a recognition, a recognition of your peers on your training and experience that you've like had these other very highly experienced herbalists review it. 
you don't have to go to a particular school. It's not a particular system. And so I think of that as the best standard that I know, that somebody has gone to a school that meets the educational standards as well as training on their own. You turn in case studies uh, for them to see whether you're doing a good job of analyzing somebody other than this herb's good for. That's considered the lowest level of herbalism. Uh, I hear this is good for me. That I have so many clients who say, I say, why are you taking this? I don't know. I read it was good for me. Zero analysis, just like, oh, then I should buy everything in the health food store and take it. That's just wrong. Um, and so for whether we do a medical analysis, whether we do Ayurvedic or Chinese or Western energetics, um, uh, if we use a traditional culture, like every native culture, whether it's the North American, First Nation people, South America, African, and so forth, they all had a system of evaluation to recognize how to give herbs to somebody. So that RH is literally saying, you can get there any way you want, but we'd like you to be able to do this. And also being able to recognize, Mira asked earlier <clears throat> about herb drug interactions. Can we recognize that? And modern science has told us some herbs have some potential toxicities long term. And so do we recognize the potential risks and contraindications for some of those herbs? Um, so I always encourage all of our graduates and, and it's an intimidating process. It's easy once you start, but like everybody who does it just sits there and cusses for a while and then they finally sit down and do it. They're like, I don't know, it was fine. Um, and, and so, uh, but it's a minimum of, I think, four years of clinical practice before you apply. Um, so it's always my goal for my students to work towards that goal. And I'm seeing more and more people in Florida, yay us, uh, with that designation. But I also know phenomenal herbalists like Seven Song, who almost as a political statement goes, I ain't doing it, which, you know, he should be reviewing all of our credentials. Uh, so it's not a, necess a necessity, but it is a good one. But also the American Herbalist Guild, as well as setting ethical standards, um, training standards. Uh, they have an annual conference, which is super fun. Next year it's in Colorado. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, that they're also looking out for us as a professional, looking to make sure there's not legislation passed uh, that restricts our ability to access herbs, which is happening every day. Um, uh, Damiana, mugwort, and a bunch of other stuff is illegal in Alabama. Lots of things are illegal in Alabama. Um, as we, you know, we've lost in Sarasota County, just south of here, you can't buy kratom, it's against the law. Um, and so like, if you think our herbs are not constantly at risk of being no longer having access to nature's medicine. Um, you wrong. And so that is one of like four organizations that's constantly watching out for us. So whatever your other professions are, um, as herbalists, I think it's always important that we support their mission. Um, there is a total, I think there's close to, uh, probably over 5,000 members at this point. There's three paid people, um, two part-time and one full-time. Everybody else is a volunteer. Um, and so check them out e even if you just follow them uh, they're constantly doing free classes and not free classes uh, or webinars uh, their conference rocks it is my favorite conference to go to and I have lots of favorites but like that is the favorite because it changes location which is super fun um, but uh, if you're interested you can join as a general member or student and then they're now got um, uh, local chapters so here in Florida I think think we're the only chapter right now there's there's been some other ones around uh, occasionally so we started ours a long time ago uh, if you can find the Facebook group the West Coast chapter of AHG um, there's other chapters for those of you who are elsewhere you may have a local chapter you can go to the American Herbalist Guild and find where your local chapter is um, and whether you're a member or not you can attend the meetings and the events and so forth so it's open to everyone you're not required to be a member um, and I think I said at 5.30 on January 7th, we're going to get ours started. It kind of shut down for COVID. We really never got it off the ground again. So we've got um, uh, that starting again. And so whether you're a member or not, if you'd like to participate, um, please join us. Uh, it'll last maybe an hour or so. Um, I think Shan's going to try to do something fun, but it'll also be a brainstorming opportunity um, to see what kinds of cool things you want to do. Um, it'll be here at the school, 6340 Central in St. Pete. And um, like one of the things, uh, Ruth, and I don't know whether Ruthie's on here or not, um, she ran it for, I ran it for a couple of years and I 
pass the reins as quick as humanly possible. Um, Ruth had uh, run it for about six years, and right before COVID hit, she they had been able to raise enough funds to start to pay some of the higher level uh, state and national speakers to come. And I think she had like five speakers lined up for the next year. And obviously everything got shut down. We had to cancel all of it. And so um, I'm really excited. Shannon has way too many ideas already. Um, and just excited to see who comes out. And with every volunteer organization, nobody's getting paid in the local chapters. Um, it always takes a, a cadre of volunteers. And so there's formal positions like president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer, um, which are way easier sounding. They're good resume builders for those of you who want to get your RH in the future uh, to put on your resume. Um, but even besides those formal positions, everybody needs help to get refreshments, to get supplies, to set up to go visit a plant nursery, to do an herb walk, whatever. So um, please, please bring your ideas um, and watch for more stuff happening from that local chapter. I'm really jazzed about what's going to be happening with that. All right, I got 30 minutes left to do the last stuff. Um, so there was a question. We didn't do a lot of Chinese medicine -y stuff, so we're going to do a little Chinese, Chinese medicine -y stuff here. I know I got a lot of, a lot of my Chinese stu students and graduates on here right now. So when we talk about organs in Chinese medicine, I don't mean your real organs. So we talk about um, heart, spleen slash digestion, uh, lungs, kidneys, and liver as our primary organs. And if I go, oh, you have liver chi stagnation, your liver's fine. Your liver enzymes are fine. Your liver function is fine. You don't need a liver cleanse. Um, it's really talking about this spiritual energetic concept of the organ, which will manifest as symptoms. And my best example is if I drink, I, I don't drink, I make lots of booze jokes. I don't drink very often. <laughs> and so like, ooh, I had a glass of wine this month. You know, it's like, oh, I was really getting liquored up. Um, if I if I have a really good wine, it doesn't affect me. If I have a okay wine or I have more than one glass, I guarantee I will wake up between 1 and 3 a.m. And every organ in the body, and, and there's more than just those couple, um, has a time slot, has a two-hour time slot. So the liver's time slot is between 1 and 3 a.m. And so I will have a hot flash and wake up around 2, guaranteed if I have alcohol. And, and so we see a a set of symptoms, we see a time slot, um, an emotional component, as well as a spiritual component that we associate which, with each one of the organs. And if you Google that, you'll get a list and there's all the five element correspondences is really cool that we teach in, I think, the first class in, in uh, the Chinese program. Um, <clears throat> But there's nuance beyond that and almost an interpretation. And I say there is, there's some very standard things, and I'll, I'll run through them here in a second. But there's also a potential for mistakes with that. And I'll give you a great example. With the kidney, we associate the emotion of fear, uh, fear and fright, and it's considered the water element. And so, um, will oftentimes uh, within the five element especially the worsley five element system where there's an american and a chinese version of five elements um they do a lot of dream analysis and dream analysis is super interesting super cool um but too often too much emphasis is put on it and, and i'll give it i love the water like i will sp i won't that is my nourishment that's my grounding i i can just be near water um i i grew up around the water I, it was funny i was joking today it's like i was born in chicago so had lake michigan uh moved to new york was literally a block and a half from the east river not pretty that was not logs floating down the river uh, and moved from there down to the bahamas and even i was stationed in germany for three years and i found like 100 yards right behind the, the tanks the motor pool there was the kinsick river that i would go down and, and i would put my toes in it and float down on a little air mattress so like my entire life I have found a body of living water. Um, and so for me, that's 
joy that's literally the opposite of fear and pride. It is safety, it is grounding and everything I could ever possibly want. If you don't know how to swim, if you almost drown once in your life or something, so both of us might dream of water. For me, it's a place of peace and contentment. For you who doesn't know how to swim or had a near-death experience in the water, it is fear or fright. So if somebody says, tell me about your dreams, and I go, oh, I dreamt I was underwater. If my practitioner is scared of the water, they say, oh, you must have a kidney problem. When the reality, if I drink a cream of water, it's actually showing my strength in my kidneys. And so our interpretation of other people's emotional components has the potential for errors. Doesn't mean it is, but we have to be careful of knowing our own imbalances, our own fears and, and inhibitions to better understand somebody else. And so that's like higher level practitioner stuff. So your heart, and I'm gonna run through these as best I can. Um, your heart, we pair with the small intestine. It is associated um, with joy and anxiety. It is associated with sleep. And the spiritual element is Shen, uh, S-H-E-N. And Shen is kind of your overall mental health. Um, it is your, your big picture emotional health, just like I am emotionally strong or I'm emotionally weak or I have mental health conditions. We usually say that's your Shen. Um, uh, interesting thing, they say your Shen is reflected in your eyes. And so... The idea that, you know, and sadly, if we have a large homeless population here in St. Petersburg and many of the folks who are not all, but many of the folks who are homeless uh, are dealing with mental health issues, sometimes properly medicated, frequently over medicated or not medicated. And most of us can walk down the street and look at somebody's face and ignore the way they're dressed. Um, sometimes they're dressed well, sometimes they're not, but there's something off in their eyes. There's something off, just I would say, the way their face is reflected, um, that makes us feel like, oh, there's something wrong there. And we can't say it's schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression or anything else, but something's wrong. And so that's that concept of Shen, like we see something is off. Um, spleen is, uh, so your spleen and stomach, and it's funny, we talk about digestive fire, so the spleen, Spleen is the best translation of the Chinese word. Um, and so I always say digestive energy slash spleen uh, and stomach. And so that's the Agni of uh, Ayurvedic medicine, the digestive fire. We associate that with the um, uh, ooh, Yi, which, sorry, I had to think for a second, Yi, um, and that's your intelligence. Um, and overthinking, pensiveness, um, worry are those emotions that we associate with that. And with the digestive energy, we are challenged by, uh -oh, am I going to make it to, I might have to do a two second pause. Ah, now we got plenty of battery life. Uh, <laughs> I am plugged to run over here. Um, so we have things in our language like, well, I, I, I was reading Shakespeare the other day and that old English, it's really hard to digest that information. It's like, what a ridiculous thing to say. And yet we see that in the Chinese culture, completely separated from European and English culture for thousands of years has seen the ability to comprehend information and our digestive energy. Um, yes. and, and so it's not like, oh, you're kind of dumb. It's our ability to comprehend the information. So I, I know people who are not going to get very high on an IQ test, who can memorize, you know, we think about certain forms of autism and so forth. Their ability to recite and memorize that's different from Yi. Yi is about taking complex concepts, understanding them and creating new ideas from that. That is our ability to digest information and create. Think about it. 
if I eat a tuna fish sandwich, somehow I magically produce hormones, muscle tissue, things like that is a ability to transform something that is not recognizable as part of my body. I transform it into this human to maintain, repair, all of that. And so in the same sense, we are able to take the information and transform and comprehend and create new stuff. Oh, yes. I, yes, it, it is, Tabitha, that is a weird thing. And so the physicality and the action of the eyes is liver, but the ability, the, the shen is reflected in the eyes. It, it is an odd concept. Um, and actually within the eye, we have uh, eye diagnosis very similar to iridology, uh, the Western iridology, where we see all of the organs actually associated with that. So the iridology, Western iridology is much more precise and detailed than the Chinese iridology. The Chinese iridology is kind of simplistic that we just look for some basic stuff. Um, the, the other part of the spleen stomach is it's associated with our immune system. Um, and so we see the direct correlation between the quality of the food that we eat and the quality of our immune system. Um, it is the producer of both chi and blood. Um, so all of our day-to-day -day energy comes from our food um, and the quality of our blood. If we don't eat foods that are high in chi, then we're not going to have enough blood to function or enough chi to function. Um, and I'm not doing the flavors with all of them, but I think with the spleen, it's important. Uh, we associate the flavor sweet with it. And so sweet not being a Snickers bar, but sweet being a carrot. Um, and if we are overthinking, our body will oftentimes crave carbohydrates. And so not to say that we make good choices with that. You know, we're not, we go for the potato chips rather than the potato. Um, but we always hear about the freshman 40 kind of thing or whatever the hell it is. So people go to college where they have to work twice as hard mentally. Mm -hmm. They're thinking, memorizing, testing, and it's also the first time on their own. And so they're eating a bunch of crap. And the spleen is also our metabolism and it is where phlegm comes from. And so like if I go and have pizza and beer, I'm going to have a phlegm fest in my belly. Um, and so it controls our digestion, elimination, i.e. poop. Um, it is part of our uh, processing of foods and fluids. And so if it doesn't work right, we end up with bloating, fluid accumulation in our schnoz and other places. Um, so I'm a big spleen guy. I think it's an, kind of an important organ. And it's the argument for the quality of the food that we eat um, making a big difference. Uh, we did spleen. Then we've got lung. Um, the lung is the lung. Like, even in Chinese medicine, we're like, ooh, we use air to form air chi and other things. Um, so we associate that with the po, P-O. Um, that's about as close to that Judeo-Christian concept of the soul. We say it enters the body on the third day after you're born. Um, and it's always interesting to me, like, if, there, you know, if we start to get into the spiritual aspects of things, um, the idea of when does the soul enter the body? And yes, you can get into a political debate about that. But what we see is when there's a preemie, they're being born early before the, the, that concept of the po or the soul enters the body. And they're put into an incubator because there's such high risk of lung infection and disease. Um, and so we actually see those preemies tend to have more immune issues, especially until their body catches up for growth and development, their immune system is compromised. Um, and so, sorry, I'm going a little, uh, you know, yay, ADD-ish here. Colds and flu, we say, are invasions of evil attacking the body. And so when our lung energy our lung chi is weak it's easy for that to happen and so when we're very young and a preemie we're put into a protective bubble right an incubator to protect us from evil wind and evil chi from attacking the baby and killing them and so it's interesting how even our modern medicine recognizes the same concept and then at some point the 
baby catches up, their growth and development, and there is Shen in their eyes, and their soul is there, and they go from a eh, to somebody's home, right? And they have better control over their bowels as time goes on. So um, we see lung and large intestine are paired, po. The emotion is grief. Sorry, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to say that. That was the question. Uh, <laughs> going a little bit further down the rabbit hole with it. Um, and so there's, ooh, I watched a sad movie and a tear comes out of my eye. Um, that actually, I, I think I said sadness. Um, I said anxiety. Sadness also goes with the heart. So there's the, ooh, there's a little tear. And then there's that wailing act of grief where we're <laughs> gasping for air that we see that act of grief associated with the energy of the lung. Um, and so uh, it's, a, again, a hard differentiation. Where does grief end and sadness begin? Like when my mother passed, I was grieving. It changed to sadness. And so where is that transition um, is always a challenge. And you see other, in some traditions, oddly, that three-day number, I, I want to say it's in a, one of the Native American groups, says you're allowed to grieve for three days. That's three days before the soul, the po enters the lungs, you're allowed to grieve for them for three days as the soul leaves the body. Uh, and so it's interesting how in different cultures, we see this inter, uh, interacting of the same concepts, uh, both coming and going with it. Um, lung, and I'm going through the five element wheel, that's why I'm like choosing these carefully. Uh, then we go on to the kidney, and the kidney is the jur, Z-H-I, uh, and we associate, that it's generally, we talk about fear and fright, um, but it also has, um, it is the physical manifestation of the brain, and so we see memory is a part of that. Um, the... Uh, willpower is a part of that so the juror translates oftentimes to will uh, and I always say when I talk about addictions sometimes I'm watching my time here I can do it uh, when we talk about addictions I was like I think there's three organs that are associated with it part of its education right in case you didn't know it smoking cracks bad for you and so yay we put a surgeon's general warning on the side of cigarettes well duh you know so that's the ye, that's the spleen, right? So we, we say, this is bad for you, here's the negative consequences of that, now stop. I don't know of anybody who stopped because of the Surgeon General's warning, right? And I think everybody knows crack's bad for you from the time you were this high, and yet people still smoke crack. And, and so that's great. And we didn't get to liver yet in the gallbladder, we say the gallbladder is responsible for decision making um, and courage, so it's kind of are interrelated. And so at some point where you're like, you know what? I don't think I want to smoke crack anymore. And so I'm like, I've made the decision. I can do it. And you stop for a day and you fall back off the wagon again the next day because you lack the willpower to carry through the decision that you made. And so we see um, relapse is very normal in any kind of, if you're like, I want to change a behavior. I want to get off. I, I want to stop coffee. I want to stop cigarettes. I'll call, take your choice. I, that we know it's bad for us, whatever that behavior is. We set a stop date, we're gonna do it, and we successfully do it, and then you fail. We've all done that. <laughs> I'm gonna eat better, I'm gonna exercise, I'm gonna yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so all three components have to be there, right? We need to have the, in, the knowledge and intellect to know that there's a reason why I'm doing this. Um, I've got to, have the courage to make a decision, your liver gallbladder. But in order to be successful long term, we need the willpower, and that's the strength of the kidneys. They're like, I'm too old to change my habits. So we see kidney has an association with aging. So the older we are, our willpower actually diminishes. And so our ability to change our habits as we age gets harder and harder and harder. Doesn't mean you can't, it means you need to take kidney tonics in order to carry it out long term um, and, and so <clears throat> so we're looking at fear and fright but I think the willpower aspect of the kidney is one of the more important aspects and we associate growth and development <clears throat> with the kidney and so um, 
growth and development is a little screaming, pooping, peeing baby to one that gets smarter and goes through adolescence and uh, puberty, adulthood, and then our decline, again, aging. Uh, as we go into for women menopause dudes we just get old and grumpy uh, and then to death and so that kidney energy is our kidney is strong and developing uh, that growth and development women on a seven-year cycle men on an eight-year cycle women mature faster <laughs> everybody remembers middle school they probably remember that uh, and then as we uh, reach uh, into our 50s then we start to see the decline, the loss of reproductive function for both men and women, the increased risk of uh, birth defects and so forth. It, that's more that genetic material. And so we see that. Um, and then the decline is the loss of, uh, and to death, which is the loss of kidney chi. The liver, the one I like the most, um, the liver, we look to irritability anger and depression are those primary emotions that is the hun h-u-n um, it is the organ of regulation and so not to say all of your hormones are liver oriented in chinese medicine but hormones regulate our day night cycle our hormones for reproduction like there's your heart produces hormones your bones produce hormones it's all about the orchestrating the perfect function of all of our stuff our digestive function all of that so if the we we want to say that the liver is flowing freely um and that will keep everything regulated in our body and part of that is we go to sleep around the same time we eat the same time we wake up the same time um but the number one monkey wrench for the liver is stress. You know, and forget the toxic, yeah, alcohol doesn't help it any. But stress is the thing we all contract. And so one of the things that we see is when the liver is weak, then it's deficient. We don't have the energy to make things happen. But when we're stressed, everything contracts and it stops the flow of chi. We end up with cold hands and feet. Uh, we get floaters or spots in our eye. Um, my favorite example, all my students, uh, okay, nobody actually remembers or watches this movie, but the original uh, Pink Panther um, <laughs> with uh, Chief Inspector Dreyfus, right, the, the boss, uh -huh. and he goes from <sighs> just frustrated with Clouseau, um, and then he starts shouting at him at some point as the movie progresses, he's like, ah, you idiot, ah. and so balled up fists, it goes from, it goes from depression to irritability, uh oh uh, to anger, we're just gonna make it. And then at the end, he goes insane, right? He's like murderous and his eye is twitching. And so whoever wrote that character was a study in Chinese medicine and the transition of the liver from one end of disharmony to the other. Um, so the Hun is also, some people will think of it as the creative state, it is our dream state. So the Shen in the heart is our awake time. And so the Hun and the Shen change places at night. And so the Hun will travel to the heart and create dreams. And our Shen in our daytime is dominant and that creates our logical lucid, uh, not having mental uh, disorders um, self. And so those two will transmission, transition from one to the other. And what we see, is there, there's hypothesis when somebody has some sort of psychosis where they're seeing and hearing things that other people don't see and hear, that that's their liver or their hun leaking through into their waking state instead of being in their dream state. Um, you know, if we look at the Aborigines in Australia, that, that idea of they believe our conscious world is actually the nightmare and that they live in the dream world that they can manipulate the dream world. And so they've presumably learned to switch from the Hun and Shen states to change those even when they're awake. And we see people talk about lucid dreaming and stuff, their life is in lucid dreaming. Um, so it's an interesting concept of all of that. So, 
hopefully that kind of answered your questions there, Kristen. Always good questions, and I appreciate them because otherwise I gotta just bullshit my way through all of this. That was all, and I like I just said some crazy ass shit for any of you who don't know anything about Chinese medicine. <laughs> See you, Tabitha. I can't wait to hear about classes. Um, so the, I would say if you want to read more about that, look for five element correspondences in Chinese medicine, and you'll find laundry lists and whole books written about all the things that I just said. And so you can go way down. That was the simplified version, and I know it sounded completely insane. Um, but it is almost that time, and my brain runneth over. So I'm going to say thank you all so much. We will be here whatever the heck the last Friday in January is. Um, if you don't remember, I am Bob Lindy. Uh, I'm a registered herbalist, acupuncture physician. There's lots of cool people in practice at acupuncture and herbal therapies on 2520 Central, as well as a full apothecary and a medicinal plant uh, nursery in the back that nobody knows about, as well as our student clinic. So please call, stop by is even better, and ask to get the grand tour. Uh, and also uh, come to Tradition School of Herbal Studies. It's online, uh, live, or in person is even better. And come on Herb Walks, come to cool classes, jump off the deep end and come to the Western or the Chinese Herbal Program. And at the very least, come next month and send your questions in ahead of time so I can Google it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful night. Enjoy your New Year's, but don't enjoy it too much so you can come to class. And I will put a copy of this, and you can find a copy of all the other ones at the YouTube page of Traditions School of Herbal Studies on YouTube. <gasps> Bye. <laughs> yeah, this is